Welcome back. Last time we looked at gaining access to this Zossi Wi-Fi CCTV camera using the serial port that we found by tearing the device down. So we connected a USB serial adapter to that serial port and what we found was the operating system had a username and password protecting it. So we tried some common ones there, we couldn't gain access. We took a step back and we looked at the bootloader on this. So that's U-Boot, a modified version of it. And using U-Boot, we transferred the firmware off the device using TFTP and the network port on the device. With that firmware, we unpacked it with Bimwalk. It didn't unpack very cleanly, but we did gain access to the password file and the root hash that is stored within that. Now I tried cracking that password hash and I had no success. So I don't know what that password is. So what we're gonna try now is we're gonna try another technique and instead of us getting the root password for this device, we're going to change the root password for the device. There's quite a difference in terms of risk here. I need physical access to this individual device to do that, to change the password. So I'm only gaining access to my device right in front of me. If we cracked that password hash and got the root password for this device, it would work across all of them. So that becomes a network attack rather than a physical attack. It's a concept of breaking a device once and running an attack everywhere, a bore attack. Right, so we're going to power up the device and we are going to go into the U-Boot console. So power it up, hit any key to stop auto-boot, we're into that console. Now this is very similar to yesterday, we're going to type help. We get the commands come up. Now we used printenv yesterday, that shows us the environment variables, but now we're also going to use setenv to modify them. And what we're going to do is we're going to append something to the boot arguments that pass the kernel to tell it just to run a simple shell. So we'll bypass the login. So we're on printenv, and you can see here, boot args, this is what we want to change. So we've got a long list of things there. Now, I actually need to change the zoom on this so I get the whole, whole line there. So now we've got everything there. So we've got that whole line of boot args. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do setenv, and I am going to copy this entire string. Now I copy it rather than um, rather than try to echo it with the variable, just because quite often that doesn't seem to work, the U-boot. And then I need to append this init equals slash bin slash sh. So now I've set that environment variable. The next thing we need to do is we need to do SF probe zero, SF read. We need to do what the device does is it boots. So we first off we probe. So all we're doing there, oh, I made a mistake. That's do that again, type it in, it's so simple. So we found the SPI flash. We're then going to copy the SPI flash from the kernel through to RAM. So that took a little bit of time as you're expecting, and then we're going to boot. So let's boot by running that. Cool. Okay, starting kernel. So what I'm expecting here is within a few seconds, instead, there we go, in a few seconds, instead of it, it having all that verbose logging and actually starting the application, it's just going to run bin slash sh. So in root there, and let's see what's running. Okay, so what's happened here is that uh, it hasn't created, yeah, it hasn't created proc and um, sys. So this is common because we didn't run any of the startup scripts. So let's mount proc and let's mount um, sys. So we're just trying to get a very, very basic uh, level of functionality going there. So we've got PS, so you can see it's, a, it's really not run very much, it's just run bin slash sh, really. Um, now we're going to run mount. So what we're looking for here, and let's zoom in a little bit actually, we're looking to see, is the file system read-write? So root there, it's a GIFS2 file system, like we saw yesterday, and it is read-write. And that's the only file system, so we've mounted it completely read-write. That means we can modify the password hash. So we're going to etc, and that was what we saw when we bin walked it out. We can now cap the password file. Again, there's that password hash that we don't know the password for. So again, we've got physical access, we've got read write, we can change it. So we're changing password for root, I'm going to change it to root. Um, so now, let's just check that. Yep. So it's changed the root password. It's using Descrypt rather than MD5. Um, that's common for passwords in BusyBox. So we now should be able to reboot the device. So power cycle it. 
and leave it to boot normally. I'm not doing that thing with the boot arguments this time, so it will start conventionally. So, yep, you can see everything flying past there, and eventually we will get to a login. Um, it's quite hard to spot it because of all the stuff flying backwards and forwards. I think I just... There we go. Root. Root. Yep, yeah, okay, there we go. Cool. We're, we're in straight as root. So it's a bit awkward seeing, but there you can see I'm running PS. There's the applications running on it. IPCmon.exe ipcam.exe and app launcher. It's odd they've called them exes. Um, I've seen that on a few uh, DVRs. I don't know why they do it. It's a strange thing for a Linux device. Right, so now we can explore this system as normal. We can examine how that, that ipcam.exe works. We can see what's going on. So the first thing we can do is uh, do if config, oh, if config dash a. So yeah, there we've got three interfaces. We've got loopback, the ethernet interface, which has got an IP address. So that must be hard coded or or set via some means. You know, this this is it's not getting a DHCP address there. So I don't know where this is coming from. Got the WLAN zero, which is the Wi-Fi interface, that, that USB connected Wi-Fi board. Um, now that MAC address, we've seen that, I think. Um, when we looked in ETC we saw two files, hostapd.conf and wpapsk.conf. Hostapd.conf will be if the device is acting as a hotspot. So if we cat host hostapd.conf, we have this SSID IPC underscore C08AC88A25C. I'm fairly certain that that is the same as, yeah, that's the same as the MAC address of the Wi-Fi interface. So it's creating, probably via a script or something, uh, a hotspot using the MAC address of the Wi-Fi device with a passphrase of 12345678. Now, I don't think it's actually running host APD at the moment. No. So it's not actually creating this hotspot, but that could be because it's in the wrong mode or something like that. We'll investigate that a bit more another time. Um, the other one was wpapsk.conf. So this will be if it's connecting to the DVR so we've got the SSID there, MVR, and then a long string of random characters. Now, I think the the DVR has a, or NVR, network video recorder, or video, digital video recorder, has a long serial number like that. So that might be the serial number. I don't know, I don't know how that was communicated between the two devices. And there we've got that PSK of 12345678. We can also have a look and see what is running on the device in terms of listening network services. So that's just netstat, which TLPN, TCP, listen, uh, process, and leave the uh, port numbers as numbers and don't don't change them into words. So there's that ipcam.exe. So three of the services running are coming from that. We've got 554, which is RTSP, real-time streaming protocol, which will be used for uh, the video streaming. We have 23 Telnet, Telnet D. We've got 8080 and 8000. These are quite commonly web interfaces on devices, um, so people change the numbers a bit. Interestingly, one of those is only listening on the Ethernet interface. So I don't know why that is. Maybe that Ethernet interface has higher privileges, or that does something more exciting than the Wi-Fi interface. I'd imagine we'd be able to connect over the network using Telnet rather than the serial console, which will be easier. We don't have to have a USB serial adapter. We don't have to have wires connected. In fact, we don't even need to take the device out of it. Oh, we would change the password but we can put it back in its case and just connect over Ethernet. So we've learned a bit more about this device and we've now got a root shell on it, but we did need physical access to gain that root shell, but it's all about piecing together the puzzle. We've had physical access, we've changed the root password, but now we can see how it operates and see what it does. And this is a powerful tool to reverse engineer. I think the next step will be for me to create a Wi-Fi hotspot with that name with that PSK and see if the camera automatically connects to it. If it does, again, we, we're starting to discover more and more issues. Could I go to a, a, a property with this CCTV installed, see that SSID, create a hotspot, and all the cameras will connect to me after I deauth them? It'd be interesting to see what happened. So we'll do that next time. So if you like this, press the like button, subscribe, the notification bell, and I'll be back in a few days with another video. Thank you for watching. Bye.